This is Christian from Necrofire. You're listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. All right. Imagine if you showed up, we did a half hour interview and Bruce didn't hit record. <laughs> <laughs> so I will tell you, as stupid as it sounds, it has happened. I've been so involved, you know, because I'm the brains and the muscle and everything of the show. And it's mm. tough when he, you know, he just shows up and he's good to make fun of me, but I'm taking care of everything. So sometimes, you know, I forget things. Well, I've been gone for a year, just about a year, and I'm back. So, Bruce? Yes, it hasn't been that long. It has been, yeah, just about. Shit. This is his first day back, so cut him some slack, Christian. Anyway, I'm Bruce. That's All my right. partner, Chris. Welcome. Thanks for, taking, thanks for taking the time, man. Of course. So what's it like over in, uh, what did you say, you're in Texas? He's in Texas, all right. Uh, it finally cooled off, so there's that at least. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about uh, Necrofire. Now right. that Prophecies of Eternal Darkness is complete, done, and finished how do you feel about it and are you satisfied with the way it turned out i feel really good about it uh we got to spend a little more time on it than probably usual just because of last year uh and we recorded it with dauber at his own studio so lots of extra time putting in some stuff we wanted to but i'm really happy with the final product uh i mean you can critique things like you do yourself over and over all the time but I'm, i'm pretty happy with how everything turned out what was the recording process like? Because, like you say, you did it during during like the height of everything that's going on. Where well, you guys like we're also in Texas, where I feel like no one really cares about anything, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nice. When, when it first started, uh, we were all kind of you know like everybody else sketched what was going on, and then after a couple of weeks or like a, you know that month, where we kind of figured out we're like, okay, well, none of us are really doing anything besides maybe going to work like on a couple of us so i think if we just hang out with you know the band and whatever i think we'll be all right so we just started recording like that cool cool so this was a record that you guys did yourselves yes that is Y'all awesome been recording forever so uh there's a certain extra level of uh, professionalism that comes with doing that with him just uh some years and years of experience but uh how how freeing do you find it to be able to not have to go into a studio? It's real nice, especially because I don't feel like we're ever on the clock, which is something I feel like I will be in my head at the studio. Because even though, say, you, you do a bunch of stuff and you need to take a break, you, you have that, oh, I'm on a break. But yeah, we're paying for this break. You know? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hated going to studios that charged hourly rates. I always wanted the lockout rate. Yeah. And you, even, you, even then. Rate, so you're not like, sitting there going oh cool we're just burning money because you shouldn't go to the studio and just completely work non-stop on something you know no i i think that's one of the benefits of how technology has helped musicians is that they're not forced to uh like go into a studio do it exactly the way that they the best that they can and then let someone else do the best they can with what the best they can and they do it in this compressed time frame and although that can give you some magic you always feel kind of let down later on, you know, it, unless you have like a gazillion dollar budget, like, Oh, you, you just, yeah, you just record forever. Yeah. You're not like Fleetwood Mac sitting in sound city for like <laughs> that's, that's a year and a half, you know, <laughs> don't you feel though, that there is a certain something or magic that might happen in the studio or the, the act of just like packing up your shit and going there adds to the whole process or no, there is uh, I feel like it's just kind of how you set everything up. And also, yeah, I mean, depending on the studio you go to, there is a like a whole kind of just uh, romantic feel of going to a studio and everything's there and the big boards and, you know, rack right. and everything. This is my thumbs down to big boards. <laughs> I absolutely. I mean, do. I don't know what anything does on the big board, but it's entertaining. to watch. <laughs> you know, lots they, of, lots of you know what they do nowadays? They just take up air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> sorry i i might be old but i'm fully digital but on some i feel like going to the studio also depends on who you're recording with because certain people can bring certain things out for, of you right and, you know like through encouragement or just through how you feel being around them and things like that sure. yeah so did you guys do drums at, at the home studio as well yes really uh, 
Dauber's got like his whole setup for everything. So he kind of, uh, he's been doing it so long that he's kind of got it down to, I guess, almost like a science, but it is a science and yeah. that's awesome. That's great. Well, I'm, a, I'm always a tech geek guy. So I always ask tech geeky questions. So here's, here's a lightning <laughs> round. Okay. Sorry. Real yeah. amps or amp sims? Both. Really? Okay, now were you blending them together or doing takes of real and takes of Sims and then blending them together? I believe it was blending them together, but I, I don't get into that process of it. I'm kind of, <laughs> I work with some of it. I'm like, this This sounds good. This sounds good. <laughs> and then, you know, I, I kind of come back and I'm like, this awesome. <laughs> if I get into stuff, it's more kind of uh, effects with pedals and other things like that. What kind of cool pedals are you using? Uh, Dark waves from Idiot Box Effects. It's chorus echo. Most everything we used on this is either reverb or some kind of chorus thing in that kind of range or echo thing. Cool. Sorry, I'm getting geeky, Bruce. You can no, take no, it from here. <laughs> no, that's fine. I've got a few notes, and then we could just go wherever we usually end up doing. Tell me about the uh, partnership with Brimming Horn Metery. How did that come about, and what is that? Uh... Season of Mist brought that to us. Uh, it's super cool. Uh, I've never had a mead before. I actually really like mead. So doing the process with them and kind of getting to choose some flavors and going back and forth like that and put the whole thing together was rad. So you guys were actually involved in, I know Chris has got his hand up like we're in fucking third grade, but um, (laughs) 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 uh, (laughs) um, so you guys had a hand in the process of picking out uh, flavor profiles look at me i sound like yeah, i went back and forth with them and like uh, i was like here's a couple ideas but you guys know better than me i want this to turn out to be somewhere on the craziest side of like okay I, all this stuff sounds great to me and it's going to be too sweet or it's going to be right uh whatever so like i kind of i sent them some things and they're like this sounds great we should try this and this with this and i'm like all right well everything sounds good and then i have a, got, I have, uh, I have, Christopher, you had your what, hand up what what is mead Can I answer? Wait, wait. Can I answer? Can I answer? It's a honey. It's a honey liquor. Okay. Okay. So can I ask you, does mead get you fucked up? You drink enough of it. (laughs) Is it like wine? Yeah, it's on the wine kind of like. Okay. I've never had it. So it's not like drinking bourbon or anything. I've actually I've actually had mead before. But when I was um, speaking with some people about this podcast earlier, they were like, what's mead? And I realized maybe a lot of people don't know what mead is. Ah. Huh? So you see, I asked these questions, not because I'm an idiot, but because I'm trying to educate. Well done. Well done. So where can you get this mead? Because I want to order some. Or can I order some? You can either get, uh, you can get it on Birmingham site, or I think you can go to the, I don't know what they call it. Is it a meadery? Is it a brewery? <laughs> I don't know. One of the one of the two. <laughs> My There's notes so- say metery, so I think we're going to go with that. We're going to go with metery. That metery. One works. But there's not many. I mean, there's uh, especially compared to how big the craft brewing industry is, especially in America. But, you know, there's not there's fewer meteries for sure. Right. There is so many craft breweries around here. It's absolutely insane. Yeah. And Bruce actually lives in the capital My of God. craft brewing in the United States. Here in Richmond. Is it really? Yes, it is. Yeah, here in Richmond, there's like one every half a block. They're everywhere. Yeah, it doesn't stop. I feel like a new one opens every other week. Yeah. So let's talk about back to Necrofire. Sorry, Chris. uh... (laughs) (laughs) That's why you got up early in Texas to deal with this. uh... Working on the mead board to try to educate people. (laughs) (laughs) You guys are writing such really intense and heavy, even dark thematic stuff. Do you find it very cathartic, especially in the times that we're living in to write that sort of stuff? I think so. I I mean, it's the, no matter what anybody wants to talk about with COVID and all other things, I mean, it's put a lot of stress on everyone in society in general. So I feel it pushes a lot more of that kind of feeling out. Just, I mean, you know, I feel like now more than ever, it feels the world's going to die. I mean, just going to end things like that, where it's just, you see so many problems and it keeps going and going and going. So yeah, I think it does fuel things like that when you're writing. Is there something you want your fans to take away from after listening to a Necrofire record or more specifically prophecies of eternal darkness? (laughs) Hey, hey, bro. I'm going to do my best in Wow. Did I'm, you lose I'm, me? I'm, I'm gonna do my impression of Bruce right now. 
Are we better? Yeah. Are we back? All right, great. What was your question? Is there something you want your fans, like when you're writing, is there something you want your fans to take away from after listening to a Necrofire record or even more specifically like Prophecies of Eternal Darkness? I mean, I know it's dark, but is there something you want them to walk away with? Uh, I don't think. In how the record was, I mean, musically, like, yeah, I would like everybody to like the record or love it or whatever you want to say in that right. range. But taking out of the record, uh, a lot of the lyrics have to do with me kind of exploring different topics of uh things that aren't for sure you know it's like kind of uh like topics of like death or where things go afterwards or you know different things that happen in the world that can't be explained right so i mean it's i feel like more of uh take something away from it as in maybe people want to go out and look for more uh just to see what's out there and things like that to see how they interpret things or go with it okay chris i see a big vinyl collection behind you I got a couple. <laughs> Holy shit, man. <laughs> that shelf has to be heavy as hell. What? Yeah. Give me I don't your th- ever move again. Yeah. <laughs> Give me your three favorite favorite records off that shelf. Oh, uh, let's see. Probably let's go with the Sombrianian from Dissection. Maybe Turbo Negro Apocalypse Dudes and i haven't heard of them in forever yeah i mean it's an old record but it's whatever yeah it's like one of my favorite rock records from that time period and i don't know on the third one just too many to name okay and and i actually do want to know what draws you to vinyl originally i started collecting vinyl when i was a teenager i was doing a bunch of punk stuff and vinyl was actually way cheaper than cds yeah and, you know, like when you're a kid, you're just like, what am I supposed to do? And I'm like, oh, yeah, vinyl's supposed to be cool. I have a record player at home. And also I can buy a record for $8 or $9 as opposed to a CD for like 14 or so. So it right. seemed like yeah. the right choice then. Yeah. But and, is this... And, you know, like that's uh, what I usually buy music on. And I listen to it either on vinyl or digitally now. Cool. Is there something about the vinyl sound that you prefer or is it just... A continuation of what you're vinyl, doing when I do you're like younger. The vinyl sound. I mean, I mean, obviously, it's harder to listen to in certain aspects than listening to stuff digitally. But also, like, say the physical aspect of it. Usually, vinyl yes. comes with some extra art, or you would have the vinyl art is much. You know, it's a bigger format than anything else they sell. Usually, comes some, you know, like extra goodies, things like that. Yeah, and just the the like almost like a cultural experience, right? Like yeah, the, yeah, you can listen to it. And it's a whole experience of like here it is, and you like un- take it out and you put it on, and it's like physically being played you know, I'm, to, I'm with you christian he's five. gonna be a dick again and not be with you but i'm no totally, no i'm not <laughs> i'm totally with you <laughs> yeah i'm 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 not uh i'm not a, i remember being a kid and getting my first vinyl which was the steve miller band abracadabra oh yeah and and i also got survivor eye of the tiger at the same time i was like four or five maybe six years old but I do remember that experience of being able to open up the record and being like, oh, my God, I can actually read the lyrics and stuff. And then you get the cassette, and you know, you're like, yep. I was like, perfect eyesight. And I can't read the damn thing because everything's so small. But um, do you guys have plans to do vinyl for yourself? Uh, the record's out on vinyl. That is killer. Where can we get and it? You can get it at either on Bandcamp or on the Season of Miss page. Awesome. Awesome. So I know you're uh, you did some runs with um, Goat Whore and you're doing some stuff with Cloak. Uh, how's it feel to be back on the road? And are there any, I mean, the world has changed a bit. Is there any precautions or different protocols you have to follow to, to actually do this? Or In Texas, there's not really any protocol. It's kind of up to <laughs> what bands want to do. I mean, I mean besides uh, being in a band, I'm a concert promoter. So I've had to deal with this for right since stuff started back but some bands want vaccinations and tests and things like that some don't care or some just don't want to affect or draw things like that but uh on those go door shows i mean it's texas and go door didn't request anything so there was you know there's people wearing masks and shows and things like that but there was right. nothing mandated are you and, guys pl- are you guys planning on taking this outside of texas uh plan to sometime next year I'm still kind of working on it it's uh some things are up in the air and a lot of uh 
you know, like some tours have just been pushed back over and over and over and over. Yes. So it's kind of hard to be like, oh, cool, what's going on now? All right, there's everything that's been being worked on for the last year and a half is already set. So we'll see what right. comes up. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I've had tickets to a couple shows and they've been postponed again and again. Like and Some of it, I think, depends on just... I mean, even say people aren't scared of getting sick as it's going to hurt them. But if you get COVID, you have to cancel, you know, at least five to six dates of your tour. So, right. you know, that instantly, especially if that's your job, makes it where you're not making money on that tour. Right. Well, and especially if you're not, it's not just the artist either. It's the crew. Because like maybe the artist could afford to take the five days off, but the crew might not be able to. Well, I mean, still the artist has to pay for everybody. So if everybody's yeah. off, they're just bleeding yeah. money for the whole week. So yeah. Or if it's at the end of the tour, it's like, cool, we made all this money to pay for everything. And now everything we're supposed to make on the tour isn't going to happen. So this was, I mean, you know, it's just. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was looking at, I was looking at Kiss, you know, and Gene and Paul both had COVID and got over it, but their guitar tech got it and died. And like, I don't know how you'd feel about that if you're out on tour and that happened to like one of your longest running employees really yeah didn't they say he was with them for like 40 years or something right? yeah it's been yeah i mean that's got to be insane i can't even imagine i i can't even imagine what that would have felt like i would have been like holy shit man <laughs> like and they There's just left point where everybody can't stay home but it's also you got to be somewhat cautious well, you know like what's actually still happening well and i think too like what are, what is kiss in their 70s yeah yeah they gotta be their guitar tech's probably in his 70s like that's that's kind of pushing the limits of even being able to be safe, you know, right. in a setting like that, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, I would 100 percent agree. Traveling and that many people, there's only so much isolation you can do, you know, and somebody goes here or somebody goes there, you know. Right. Oh, yeah. And then you have catering staff at every place and stage and the stadium, yeah, especially in that there's so much. I mean, you can have crews and everybody wear masks and do whatever. But, you know, you're playing shows like that. There's hundreds and hundreds of people working every day. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's and and I think too being a touring act which is which is I think cool that you guys are smart doing this in Texas because at least you have a set of ideas that you can work with. Mm -hmm. But if you're a national touring act and you have 50 states to go through. Oh, I can't even imagine having to figure out what the different protocols are for the entire United States. Right. Yeah. Like different cities even have different mm -hmm. and different promoters and oh my god. It's crazy. But anyways, back. Sorry, I'm hijacking the conversation, Bruce. <laughs> what's uh, what's next for Necrofire? Uh, try to figure out some, hopefully, like some tours in the U.S. next year. I don't really feel Europe is probably a possibility until 2023. Just this, when we're talking about everything's been pushed back. So, like, all the festival lineups are just, like, going, going, going. So, hopefully, Europe 2023, but, you know, you never know. And the a U.S. tour, maybe some festivals next year. Yeah. Uh, Any sort of live streaming or anything like that? Next record. <laughs> yeah. Any what? Any sort of live streaming or anything like that? Or that's not a. Possibly. I don't really. I'm not a big fan of the live stream. Right. It's. I don't know. I feel like everybody wants to go to shows. Yes. If you're going to do something live stream, we would have to do something special other than us just playing. So maybe if, if I sit on it for a while and came up, we came up with an idea that works. And it wasn't just say us playing on a stage. It would be kind of cool, but I don't want to just put us on a stage and be like, Hey, here it is. Right. Yeah. We're playing live. Yeah. I, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, that was cool. Yeah. Like, at the beginning, yes, I it was agree. like, Hey, okay, let's do this. Let's support us. And then it's just cool. Here's another live stream. Okay. Yeah. Cool, stream. And then everyone started doing live streams from their living room with like their cell phones. Yeah. yeah and it's just like, eh, yes. you know, like it was cool well, at the start you know, because no one knew a lot different. I mean, if you're going to the concert, you can, you'll go see a band play and they can play and you can, you get into it or you don't. And you know, you can have, you have an experience, but if you're watching it, I feel like you have to add a bunch of extra visual effects, or visual effects. If you're just sitting in your room, watching it on your TV or your computer, or at least I think you hit it on the head, make it more than just your cell phones. Do it right. Yeah. Like, you know, I saw Catatonia. Jesus, sorry, my dog is going fucking crazy. <laughs> um, I saw Catatonia do it in the beginning and they did it, you know, with like a 12 camera shoot and it was absolutely killer. And then I've seen bands do it, like you said, with the, you know, with their soul. And it's a big difference. And I think it makes a big difference, especially if you're paying money to see it. Yeah. Yeah. If you just have one camera sitting on the band, it's like, okay, here we go. I mean, it costs yeah. 
more money, more people, more time to make it come out like, you know, something right. special. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. So what's a Necrofire show like? Uh, Loud, dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of live stream, I don't know if you guys have seen the Machine Head live stream that they do on Fridays. I watch it every Friday. Electric happy hour. It is crazy. A friend of mine just said it to me last week, and I was like, this is how a live stream should be. They're just crazy. They just sit. What's that? It's entertaining. Oh, it's oh great. my God. They just sit there and get pissed and play cover songs. Yep. Oh, okay. And Last he has week, different people playing. It's always Rob. And then sometimes it's a bass player. Sometimes it's guests. Sometimes it's the whole band. It's, it's great. I'll check yeah. That out. And last week it was Halloween. So they were all dressed up and it was like, it was like almost an intimate view into hanging out in their rehearsal space. That's cool. Yeah. And the, the best quote I heard was, oh, what are you drinking? He's like, oh, this is one of my top 30 beers, he said. <laughs> I was like, that is such a killer quote. And it's free. So, I mean, he's got a tip jar or whatever, but it's free. So it doesn't matter if it's filmed well. Yeah. You, know, you know what you're getting into. It's just him bullshitting with everybody. And I, I like it. I think it's a good way to keep in contact with fans and whatever. So you know, anyway, that's really good. I also like the tip jar thing opposed to saying charging money like if yes. 10, even if it's 10 bucks or whatever because you should charge except if, you know with youtube and everything else i feel like everyone on the internet just thinks it should be free anyways yes well that how how now this is going to get us off topic really how oh yeah how do you think artists or record labels or i guess those business people how do they tackle that problem when an industry that relies on talent has that talent not getting paid? How how do you tackle that issue? I really don't know. I think musicians just get screwed the, like where it's at, at the moment. Well, I agree with that, but there has to be a better way. And I I'm mean, just... so I completely agree there has to be a better way, but I really just don't know. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can try with different things, you know, because now it's the point where you only really make, like money is being made like from touring, things like that. So... I mean, you could say the same thing with maybe doing some streams and other, but I don't, I don't really know. Yeah. I, I just, I've been thinking about it because during COVID, I personally know a lot of people that lost everything mm -hmm. because of what they do, which right. is either concert promoters or um, uh, festival promoters, Tour roadies. Managers, right? Yeah. yeah. I, they lost everything. Like some people that I know were forced from being on top of the world to being a cashier, you know, yep. and, and there has to be a way and there has to be some type of situation to help these people out, you know, but not, not necessarily like a handout, like here's money for you, but how do, how do, how do people get through this without losing everything? Cause music is such an integral part of life in everybody's life, whether they know it or not. And it's the way you get through a lot of the shit. Absolutely. Uh, I really don't have an answer. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting all so, deep and you're like, so, dude, yeah. it's so, seven so, in the so, fucking morning. Those so have started to come back. So a lot of those people have work, are starting to work again, but some people have moved on. I mean, it's a tough industry to work in anyways, besides right. uh, having COVID shut everybody down for, for a year or more. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting all deep, and you're like, it's 7 in the morning. What the <laughs> fuck is going on, man? Like, what? 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 Dude, I don't know if you know how many meads I had last night. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not ready for this. Don't worry, neither am I. I'm just yeah. shooting the shit. I mean, I feel like that question is a lot of what everybody in the music industry, especially band and management, try to figure out, except it's there's no, no one has a real right. answer to it. No, there is no answer that I can find. That's what they were doing that save our stages thing for a lot of clubs and bands and manager, or, you know, all right. across. That was, you know, I feel like there's a lot of attention brought to jobs that people didn't know existed if you didn't work in music. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. Mean, there's this guy that you talk to that calls this other guy, that then talks to a club and then books this. And then there's, you know, 40 people that work that show that night, you know, and catering yeah. and everybody, right? I mean, there's everything. And not to mention the restaurants around the venue that, fill up oh, yeah, before yeah. and after and bars next i mean there's just so many things that affects if there's a big show you know uh, everything in the area and people working 
Absolutely. Not just um, say the man and whatever. Right. The video. All right. Well, that's all I've got. I hit my list. Chris, you got anything? I don't, man. I really appreciate you taking the time and putting up with me because <laughs> this is this I'm is my it back. This is my first show back in a year. Yeah. Um, he uh, he had a surgery. <laughs> <laughs> He, yeah, be, I, he was Christine for a while. I, I, yeah, I was. <laughs> I, I had a surgery by the United States government. Yeah, I'm from Canada, so he, you're like, oh, that explains. They finally it. let you back in on over the internet. We weren't allowed before. No, no, I live in D.C. Oh, okay, but but my visa ran out, and I was in like this weird legal gray area because I'm on my wife's visa, mm-hmm. so I wasn't allowed to work or leave the country or do anything until they process my case. And then yeah. once my case was processed, then I could come back or stay and work. It took a little extra time to get it processed, I assume. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> About a year. <laughs> so believe it or not, you're privileged since his first day back. It's pretty cool. No! <laughs> anyway, Christian, I I'll appreciate you taking back. the time. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, no problem. Hey, can Bye, we guys. get a scream before you go? Uh, that's too wait, really? Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Have I'm a good day. Go. That's all right. Have a good day, my friend. Take care. Okay. All right. Yeah, bye. Hello out there. Yes, we're out there, everyone. I'm Hal Schwartz. And I'm Flynn McClain. Together, we host None But the Brave, a podcast dedicated to the music and career of Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and E Street Band are on tour right now for the first time in six years, and we're taking a detailed look at what's happening on stage in our bi-weekly episodes. We've also been recently joined by some very exciting guests, including rock journalist Warren Zanes and Stephen Hyden, Backstreet's Magazine founder Charles Cross, and Barstool's Kirk Menahan. If you're a diehard Springsteen fan, this is the show for you. So please subscribe to Them But the Brave on your favorite podcasting platform, and we hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much. We'll be seeing you.